Okay guys, um, it's just on nine o'clock. So uh, our, first, our first talk and our keynote is by someone that I absolutely guarantee needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, he's responsible for the entire reason we're here. Rasmus, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm on, good. Oops. Okay. So, um, all my slides, like as always, will be or are already on talks.php.net. They are now mobile compatible. I don't have a phone, but you guys do, so. <laughs> um, people tell me this is 20 years of PHP, which I don't really like to think about because it makes me feel quite old and reminds me how long I've been working on the same damn thing. Um, very few of you wrote code 20 years ago or more than 20 years ago that you're still working on today, I bet. There might be a couple, but very, very few of you. Okay, yes, Monty, yes. <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> um, but it's kind of scary, actually. Um, to be 20 plus years into this. I mean, and 20 years ago, on June 8th, 1995, I made a release on Usenet. And so to me, it's not a 20 year anniversary at all because you don't release something the day you made it, right? It took me a while to build the thing that I released in 1995. I started in 1994, so to me, 20 years was last year. But for sort of the public, I guess it's 20 years this year. It was an interesting announcement, actually, because it was, it was all marketing initially. Um, I posted it to Comp Infosystems, WWW authoring CGI, which was sort of the collection point for people trying to do something dynamic with the web. The web in 1993, 1994 was not dynamic at all. There was nothing dynamic. It was like a newspaper. You might go back to a website every day to see if they had put up some new static content. You didn't log in, you didn't interact with sites. It was just static newspaper-like pages. Um, and slowly, we started building dynamic stuff. And with the introduction of CGI, Com Gateway Interface, we could build dynamic websites, mostly using Perl in the early days. Um, I wrote a lot of C CGI programs as well. And that collection of C CGI programs was something I put together in this announcement, which has a whole bunch of things that basically tries to say, this tool can solve this long list of problems. And this was kind of a laundry list of problems that people had in 1994, 1995, which is kind of odd to look at now. It's like a museum piece looking at those problems. Um, the interesting part, and also here are some things you don't need. Everyone was on a shared server. Nobody had root access. Everyone was just on very, very cheap shared accounts. They had a public HTML directory in their home, home directory. Um, and they didn't have any control over the configuration or logging or anything, and that annoyed a lot of people. So these tools tried to address that. The interesting part of the announcement is right here. Ability to use form information in following documents, which is basically variables and parsing post requests, putting that stuff into variables and then allowing you to use them to do things. There's no sign of this being a language in this announcement, as you can tell, right? It's a set of tools. It happened to have this template language underneath that was used to build all these tools. And then behind that was a C API. And when people got more involved and started reading more of the documentation, that was where I tried to sort of pitch them on the idea of using the C API as the API for the web. Instead of using CGI, which involved forking a new process on every single request, which is super, super expensive, I wanted them to write tools or add tools to this list of tools, or write their own custom tools using the C API. I thought it was very simple. It was a stack-based API um, when you put a macro or when you put a tag into your HTML. Mark it up with a little PHP markup. 
So bracket question mark. Um, and then you could put whatever you wanted in there, basically. And it would call into the C backend. It would call a function by the name of that tag, essentially. So if you wanted to add a cosine tag to your web pages, you could write it in C like this, where first you say stack pointer s, pop the last element off the stack. The last element on the stack was the argument that was passed if an argument was required for that particular function. You would pop that off. You would do something to it, in this case call the C level cosine function. And then you would push the answer back onto the stack. And that would then get replaced, or that would replace that HTML-like tag that you would put into your template, and the cosine of that argument would show up in your web page. This was what I thought PHP was. I thought it was the C API for the web. Nobody agreed with me. Nobody wanted to write C code. They looked at all the tools and all the, basically the template tags that I had provided, and they said, this is great, but we also need these tags. And I kept trying to convince people, well, here's the API, write the tags. The whole point is, this is to get you started, and then you write your own tags. Like, no, 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 C is hard. Um, so I said, well, this is not hard. And then I would write it. I said, look, it's like four lines of code. It's easy. It's like, oh, great, that works. Now I need this tag. <laughs> <laughs> and they tricked me like that. I wrote hundreds <laughs> of tags like that, trying to convince people how easy it was. And eventually, this thing just grew and grew and grew. And the web exploded. By this time, the web was just amazingly, the growth rate of the web at that point was just amazing. And there weren't enough programmers. And the more serious programmers thought the web was silly, it was a toy, it was a fad, it wasn't going to do anything. It was hard to hire a serious programmer to write web applications at that time. And you ended up with a lot of non-programmers technical writers writing web applications. And those folks didn't want to write C. They didn't care about the C API that I thought was what PHP was. They just wanted something. They wanted to take an existing HTML document, mark it up a little bit, make it dynamic, and have it solve their problems. They didn't want to compile anything. They didn't want to learn about C, GDB, anything like that. It was way too hard. And companies couldn't hire enough people to fuel the growth that the web was experiencing. So that's how we ended up where we are today, where a C API and a very simplistic templating mechanism became the language of the web. It wasn't the intent. Uh, I, had no, I had no plan for it to happen that way at all. It just kind of happened. Alternate tools didn't solve the problem as quickly or as easily or as intuitively as PHP did. It also means that we have a lot of baggage coming along because a tool that was written to do one thing that then gets used in another way and then that way changes, that way changes, that way changes. Um, and it's been, for me, it's been almost 22 years now. That baggage builds up over the years. Personally, I think it's crazy writing huge applications in a non-compiled, non-strictly typed language. To me, I don't understand some of the things that have been written in PHP. It's like, holy smokes, that's crazy. But, but people do it. <laughs> so where are we today? I'm going to leave some time for questions at the end, by the way. So if you think of any questions along the way, hold them to the end, and we'll have a nice little 10, 12-minute discussion, hopefully. So PHP 7 is coming out this year. We have a ton of interesting new things. The biggest thing, at least for me, is the performance. Performance, as you can see, 100% plus performance gain on most real world applications. You can do all kinds of micro benchmark and get way, way more than 100% on some things. But on real world applications, the WordPresses, Laravel apps, um, things like that, bulletin board systems, you're going to see at least double performance simply by upgrading to PHP 7. And hopefully, very few things will break. It'll use less memory. Um, and we also have, we've, if you're doing any sort of internals hacking in PHP, 
the fact that we got rid of TLS is very, very nice. Um, or we, we got rid of the TSRM macros and switched over to native TLS. Um, so the code is a lot cleaner in that respect. We have an AST now, an abstract syntax tree, which I'm hoping will encourage people to write more tools. We really need um, some static analysis tools, um, things like that, um, which we've had, we have some, but they're not great. I'd like to see a really solid static analysis tool built on top of the AST in PHP 7. So if you want a project, please. Um, return types on functions with this syntax, colon, and then the type that's supposed to get returned. If you return the wrong type, here it's returning an int instead of the array, um, you get an error that looks like this. It is a catchable fatal error, so your error handler can, can deal with it if you like. We have a null coalesce operator as well. The trick on this one is that if a variable is not defined, like x here, you're not going to get a, a warning on it. Um, so it, it cuts down on a bunch of boilerplate code where you're checking empty or is set on things. Um, but you do have to be aware that if you do make a variable typo here, it's not going to alert you. You're not going to get a notice. So the, the whole reason for being of the null coreless operator is to be in the same class as is set and empty and things like that. That will not warn you if you got the variable wrong. And you can see how it works, right? So the first non-truish <laughs> will return here, right? So A or B, A is null, B is set to 1, so that's going to return 1. C or B. C is 2, so that's going to return 2, right? A, B, or C, um, so the first non-nullish, so B is going to be the first one returned. Here, A is null, X is not set, C is 2, so you get 2. Should be obvious. Exceptions on fatals. This one, we've been, we've been circling around it for a while. Um, a lot of people are, want every error basically to be an exception, every engine error to be an exception, every warning, every notice like that. The problem with that is that the migration path is horrible. Things that were notices before, you can't suddenly turn them into exceptions because a non-called exception is fatal. And then every app out there would start fatling everywhere because nobody writes clean code. Um, but for fatal errors, for fatal errors we can do it. We can switch fatal errors over to exceptions because there's no change. If you don't catch the exception on the fatal error, you get a fatal error and you're done, just like happens today. But it does let you do a little bit more. So if you do want to um, try to catch fatal errors, you can put a try catch around it. Um, it gives you a stack trace. Um, so there's a little bit more you can do in case of fatal errors. Hopefully your code doesn't have a whole lot of fatal errors. But st stuff like this happens all the time. You have some method that calls a method on an object, right? And for some reason, object is null. You might be chaining a whole bunch of them together, and somewhere along the chain, something happened that you didn't expect, right? In this case, you can actually catch it. Um, like with any exception, it's not, you can't continue, obviously. You can catch it and deal with it, but you can't continue along the current code path because the state is unknown. We've removed a whole bunch of old stuff that we've been warning people about for years, which is now finally completely gone. So the old uh, ereg functions, which is from Henry Spencer's library from like 1988 that hasn't been updated in 10 years, that is finally completely gone. If you're still using eregs, you have a little bit of conversion to do. It's not, it's not too bad. The difference between pregs and eregs aren't that big, but there are some. EXT MySQL, we finally removed that from the core distribution. It's still available in Peckle. I know lots of code still relies on it. The interesting thing for us about moving something out of core is, is more that it's kind of, we don't need to worry that much about it anymore. But for end users, there's very little change because people tend to not get PHP from us. They tended to get it from their distribution. 
and the distributions for years and years have already been splitting out everything into separate packages. So you'll have a PHP MySQL package that you install, or an RPM or a .deb. And whether the packager got that from the core source or from the Peckle repository, you don't even know. So it's kind of, for us, it's, it's quite symbolic that we've removed it from the core distribution. For end users, the difference is going to be minimal. Longer term, the difference might be that when 7.1 comes out, 7.2, it might take a little while for ext or for Peckle MySQL to be ported. Maybe nobody will. We'll see. Hopefully somebody will. I mean, if people are still using it, then you might be on the hook for porting that application or porting that extension to future versions. Um, we'll see. Well, it depends how long the maintainer is interested in maintaining it. This doesn't mean that we don't support MySQL, obviously, for those who don't know. We have three, well, up to PHP 7, we had three different extensions for talking to MySQL. We have PDO, we have MySQL I, and we had MySQL. Now we're down to two ways of talking to it. Most other databases only have one way of talking to it. Um, other things in here, nothing really that should affect anybody too badly. Most of these are pretty minor. Uh, all this one might affect you. The PREG replace eval. So slash E on PREG calls has always been rather risky because it essentially calls eval on matches. And it's hard to figure out what that might do to you if you don't have a lot of control over your input. So it was always a very shaky thing. Um, on well-sanitized input, sure, no problem at all. On unsanitized input, big problem. So that has been removed. You now use a PREG replace callback instead. So you just pass it a, a function or callback. Um, you can use a closure, and that will take the matches, and then you can write code to act on those matches directly so you're not just evaling arbitrary stuff. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, you can skim through this yourself. Most of these doesn't affect too many people. 64-bit integer support for Windows. Previously, even on 64-bit Windows, because of the way Windows works and the compilers and the way the PHP code was written, your ints, your longs would still only be 32-bit. Now that's been fixed, so your longs on 64-bit windows will be 64-bit. I'm sure Pierre will talk more about that tomorrow. Okay. Um, cleaned up some edge case integer overflow underflows. Um, this only really affects you if you're dealing with max long and negative max long type numbers in your apps. Um, and you can now catch, which can now also be, um, it's a catchable fatal error, which is now also an exception for a call to a member function on a non-object that I showed earlier. This one might also trip up a few things. Here, basically this is support for all kinds of code that you shouldn't be writing. <laughs> but it might annoy you at some point that it's not consistent in what works and what doesn't when you do crazy things like this, right? So here you have a variable function that returns an array, and you're dereferencing and getting the bar element, which is then a closure that you want to call, right? Don't write code like that. Nobody knows <laughs> what the hell you're doing. Uh, but this does work now. And most of these examples are code that you shouldn't have been writing in the first place. But many people over the years have been write, trying to write stuff like this. It doesn't work, and they file a bug. It's like, it doesn't work. Like, yeah, we know, but why? <laughs> but this now works. In cleaning this up and making everything consistent, we've made it more consistent with what you would expect just reading the code. Everything is left to right. So when you're trying to dereference things, um, some of these things could be taken in, in different ways. 
this particular one can't really. Um, I don't have a good example, do I? Let's see. Yeah, so you have to be careful of, of sort of order of operations. There was a case, do I have internet here? I don't. I'll come back to it later. I did have to fix a bug in one app when I was going through and testing various apps on PHP 7 where they were doing, they were calling, um, I think they're dereferencing an array of closures and they were calling, so they had a, a property in an object set to an array of closures and they were expecting that to basically dereference the array of closures first and then call the name of that property on the object whereas it goes the other way around now in PHP 7 so you have to use brackets to indicate I want to do this part as a whole first but it's always left to right so this one would have worked okay but if you wanted to do say this part and then make that the name of the object or the name of the property you have to put parentheses around this part if you want to do the right side before the left side that's a horrible explanation but I'll show you the bug in a bit other things uh, we have a new Unicode code point escape mechanism slash u or backslash u and then you can just put in the the actual code point so 202e which is the right to left Unicode um, hack then you have this weird smiley dude 1f602 which goes to the left even though I echoed it second because we're now right to left right as soon as you switch the right to left, everything goes the other way. And it actually worked in my browser here. Amazing. Um, there's a new ICU Intel char class added to the Intel extension. If you know anything about ICU, you should already know what that does. And we have a few more things. There are a few more RFCs that are still in the works that haven't passed yet. I think another five or six probably. <laughs> So expect to see a few more things with the first RC, June, July, August. Technically, it's supposed to be June, but I have a feeling that might slip a bit. So that's what's on the schedule for PHP 7. Now, I spent the last month or so playing with PHP 7 and playing with lots and lots of applications. This first graph is a nice little illustration of how we got to this 100% plus performance boost. So mostly Dimitri, Chen Chen, and Nikita spent 2014 hacking away on the engine. And they took WordPress 3.6 just as a baseline app. Also the internal benchmarks and stuff. But WordPress 3.6 was the real world app they were looking at saying, well, what do we do to make this faster? And they started by counting the number of machine instructions and the amount of time it took to make 100 requests against the WordPress front page. Um, I think it only had one article on the front page, so there wasn't much there. It, wasn't, it also wasn't a very fast machine. It was a two-processor slow machine. But anyway, it took 26 seconds on January 20th 2014 and it took 9.4 billion instructions to serve up those hundred front pages and they just started whittling away and saying okay now they changed a few things got it down to 23.6 seconds and down to 7.4 billion instructions and you keep going and going and going and going to the point where at the end of the year December 31st they're down to 12.6 seconds and 2.9 billion instructions. So basically cut the number of instructions, to, and that's low level machine instructions that it takes to serve those 100 pages by a factor of three. Now time only dropped by about a factor of two because not all instructions take the same amount of time, right? But this was, this was the iterative process that they took, which is pretty impressive. You're basically taking something really complicated and without breaking anything, removing two-thirds of the machine instructions that it previously took to accomplish that one thing, which is hard. But it's really, really cool. And it's cool for people who are going to be using PHP 7. So I'm going to show you some benchmarks. Now, 
other people's benchmarks are 100% meaningless. So don't trust any of my benchmarks. Go do it yourself. Do it on your own code. Other people's benchmarks really don't mean anything. But it can give you some guide, at least, to say, Here, here's something I should test. This might be worth my time testing, because some other people who may not be lying to me, they might be, but there's a chance I'm not lying to you. So that should give you an indication. You should probably try your code on PHP 7, and you should probably expect some decent performance boosts. You could try to replicate my benchmarks in exactly. I've tried to specify everything I used. So down to the motherboard, and number of processors, where the hyper-threading was on and on, it was on. So it was an eight physical core box, giving me eight virtual cores, sort of four physical core box for eight virtual cores with hyper-threading enabled. An SSD, Linux Debian, MySQL 5.6.22. Um, I configure flags for building PHP and GCC 4.7.2. My INI that you can go through. Um, nothing really interesting in my INI. I think everything is default. I set my time zone. Um, I think the only thing that's interesting here, I set my opcast revalidate frequency kind of high to 60 seconds. Right, so it's only going to stat and check for updates every 60 seconds. That's probably the only real performance thing that I added to my INI. Oops, wrong way. Um, my PHP, so I'm running everything under PHP FPM, under Nginx in this case. Not necessarily because it's a whole lot faster. In the real world, whether you're using mod PHP or PHP FPM, your requests spend so little time at the web server level and spend so much time in the PHP code and talking to databases and stuff, even if Nginx plus PHP FPM was twice as fast as Apache, you end up with almost an immeasurable difference at that point because there's so little time spent at that level. I think it is kind of slightly faster. I haven't been able to measure it faster. I can only measure it being faster on very static, completely simplistic hello world stuff. For real-world applications, I really haven't seen much of a difference. But um, you'll see in a bit why I chose Nginx and PHP FPM. My Nginx conf. Um, and here's why I chose PHP FPM, because I'm also testing HHVM at the same time. And it can only use fast CGI. So I wanted to play in the same ballpark as HHVM here. And here's an example of one of my site configurations. So this is my configuration for WordPress. And I have it set up, so I just have a simple include. I can comment out to switch between PHP and HHVM. And my HHVM config. Kill your phone, man. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so the first benchmark, in no particular order. This was just the first thing that I installed. So I grabbed Drupal 8 beta 4, and I created a single front page node going through the normal Drupal stuff. And I tested these five versions of PHP. So 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, and HHVM 3.5, which is the current version of HHVM. This is request per second at 20 concurrent requests. So I'm hitting it with 20 concurrent clients and getting 93 requests per second back from PHP 5.4, 95, 5.5, 101 in PHP 5.6. So you can see we, we have made performance improvements as we go along in PHP 5. There was actually a big jump from 5.3, but Drupal 8 doesn't run on, on 5.3. You'll see that in a bit. Um, but then you have this jump to PHP 7, which is very impressive. HHVM as well is super impressive on this. There's a big jump from PHP 5.6 to HHVM 3.5. But both of these run Word or run Drupal much, much faster than PHP 5. If we look at less requests per second, so at five requests per second, it doesn't look all that different. Um, or at 50 requests per second, or sorry, 50 concurrent requests. It also doesn't change that much. The, the shape of these graphs tended to not change that much based on how many concurrent requests I was sending along. Um, and latency, 
So if we go back to 20, so the latency at 20 requests, 20 parallel requests, is 210 milliseconds, 210, 200, 110, 130. Um, if we turn on latency for 5 and 50 concurrent requests, here's a little lesson. Uh, you can upgrade PHP all you want and upgrade to HHVM. What really matters for fast pages is that you don't overload your machines too badly, right? If you only have eight virtual cores and you're trying to do 50 concurrent requests, it's going to hurt. Those cores are really, really busy. They can't multiplex that much, right? So your latency drops off. So this is five concurrent, 20 concurrent, and 50 concurrent on this Drupal page. All right, WordPress 4.1, same numbers. WordPress runs on everything. So I was able to go back to PHP 5.3. So this is PHP 5.3 with APC, PHP 5.3 with Opcache, and then 5.4, 5.5, 5.6. So here you can see a nice progression as well. Up. And then a huge jump to PHP 7. And HHVM in this case is faster. Than, than PHP 7 on WordPress 4.1. And for the other numbers, 50 and, and 5, it's, it's the same shape again. They're very close. Um, for between 20 and 50, it's actually not that big a difference once you get up in that level of concurrency. And latency again, I'll turn off. I have too much going on in my graphs. So latency at 5, 20, and 50. You can see page latency now. If you're doing 50 concurrent requests, has dropped from, if you're going to PHP 7, from 270 down to 90. So your pages are a factor of 3 faster if you're upgrading from PHP 5.3 and APC. How many people in here are still on PHP 5.3 or older? You should be pretty embarrassed about <laughs> I can see a lot of them. <laughs> please, please, please get up to date on, on this stuff. Get on to PHP 5.6 as soon as you can. Um, and then help us test PHP 5.7. We'll talk more about that. Sorry, 7. Yes, sorry. Um, PHP BB, very popular bulletin board package that you see everywhere. So this was... Um, this is just default install. I created one post. I think I've created one forum with one post in it, and I went to that forum and viewed that one post, and that's what I was benchmarking. And here again, you can see the progression. 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, a huge jump to PHP 7. And here, PHP 7 is a bit faster than HHVM 3.5 on this particular one. Latency at 20, you can see we've now dropped from 60 milliseconds, or even if you're running PHP 5.6, from 40 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. So your pages are twice as fast upgrading. MediaWiki, here we can see why Wikipedia switched to HHVM, because they run MediaWiki really, really well. PHP 7 runs it pretty damn well as well. I mean, from PHP 5.3, you have an almost, well, not quite, 2.5x, not quite 3x increase going to PHP 7. Um, but you get even more if you're running MediaWiki going to HHVM. Open cart. This one, you can see that we didn't have a whole lot of success speeding up open cart, going from 5.4, 5.5, 5.6. Five, 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 um, and yeah, there's a bit of a jump. 400 requests per second to 455. HHVM is having trouble as well, 400 to 417. The only way I could make this graph not look super flat was to add PHP 5.3 <laughs> without an opcode cache. So this is PHP 5.3 with no opcode cache at all to show that, OK, there, there is a difference here. The, the problem with this one, with op OpenCard, is it spends all of its time in the database. When I looked at the machine, MySQL was just grinding away. Grinding, grinding, grinding. There were some 20, 30 full table scan requests, it seemed like, on hitting just this front page. Um, so no matter what you do, it doesn't matter how fast we make PHP or HHVM, if you're spending all your time in the database, 
we're not going to be able to speed up your database. Talk to Monty about that. It's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Monty. <laughs> um, Latency-wise, again, yeah. Going from PHP 5.6 to PHP 7, you might get 10 milliseconds better on the pages. Um, going from PHP 5.6 to HHVM, it didn't do anything for you. So if you're running open cart, well, you're, you're kind of out of luck. You're, you're not going to get a whole lot of boost from this. Um, Wardroad CMS, kind of a weird one I picked, but I just wanted some random Laravel application that wasn't super mainstream to show what this new version might do to your own custom Laravel apps, which a lot of people seem to be interested in. And here we can see the same kind of progression with PHP 7 running Laravel apps really, really well. And the other thing about these is I've shown a whole bunch of applications now. They all ran, right? Um, I had to fix, I think it was in wardrobe CMS, I had to fix this one. Um, issue with the, the ordering where I had to put parentheses around one thing. Um, and I fed that upstream, but that was the only change I had to make in, in all of these 10 applications to, to actually get them working. So it should be relatively painless to upgrade to these. Geeklog, another blogging application, which also ran perfectly in all of these versions here basically 2x on it. So it's getting a bit monotonous. It's a whole lot faster. Um, track, which is a ticketing mechanism, bug tickets and stuff. Much, much faster again. Track is super, super fast to begin with. You, you can see our requests per seconds were up in 1860. So 1860, all the other apps here are playing down in the hundreds. If we go back and big, I mean, this is the same hardware. And you kind of get the idea that not all apps, I mean, they're obviously doing completely different things. But some apps really are spending a lot of time churning away at things. Drupal here is spending a lot of time doing something, even though there's only one node um, there. Seems like that could be faster. But that's not my thing to say. <laughs> um, so here we go. Track was the fastest of the ones I, I checked, with the to the point where I almost couldn't measure latency. So latency had five concurrent requests. I couldn't even measure it. Um, I had to get up into at least 20 concurrent requests to get measurable latency. And then at 50 concurrent requests, it was up to 30 milliseconds, which is still super, super fast. Anything under 100 milliseconds for web pages is perfectly fine. Nobody notices as, as when you're under 100 milliseconds. Once you get above 100 milliseconds, so if we go back to Drupal here, um, and we start looking at latencies, right? Even at 20 concurrent requests, you're starting to sneak above. 100 millisecond latencies, even with PHP 7 and HHVM. So this hardware really shouldn't run 20. It should be configured to only do 10 to 15, probably, to get the kind of performance out of it that you want, especially when, as you put more content into the application. So please help us test. So this was me basically testing 10 different applications that I randomly selected. I haven't tested your application, most likely. You should test your application. And please test it before the first release candidate. If you're at all interested in, in having your code work this year on PHP 7, over the years, we've had so many people come and tell us that we broke their app like two months after our final release, even though we've had months and months and months of release candidates and. The code is in, in Git. You can test it now, even well before the first release candidate. You could have tested it three months ago. Um, please, please test. And I know it's not that easy, but it really is actually easy. I, to help you a bit, I built you a Vagrant box. You have no excuse. This thing runs on Windows. It runs on Mac. It runs on Linux. It runs on anything that runs Vagrant. 
which is basically everything. Um, you do a git clone of this PHP 7 dev GitHub repo, see the insert, type vagrant up, and then that, this will download your image. It'll download the virtual machine. It's a Debian virtual machine, but it shouldn't really matter to you what it is. So go have a coffee. When you come back, type vagrant SSH, and you are now in a virtual machine environment that has PHP 7 and every version of PHP actually pre-compiled for you. You can go with your web browser to 192.168.77. You'll get the PHP 7 info page. And you have a Rasmus approved dev box to use at that point. You can switch versions. So if you're testing on different versions of PHP, just do a sudo new PHP 5.6, for example. That will switch to everything to PHP 5.6. If you're building extensions, at this point, you can type PHP eyes, configure make, make install. You'll now have built your extension for PHP 5.6. Switch back to PHP 7 debug, same way, new PHP 7 debug. And there are 20 pre-compiled versions of PHP in this virtual machine that you can quickly switch around between to test your application on different versions of PHP or to build your extensions on different versions of PHP. This been, I think I released this machine about a month ago. There have been quite a few changes. So one of the first things you might want to do is see the into PHP source and do check out master. Make sure you switch to the master branch. It should be on the master branch already by default. Git pull minus R to get all the changes. Make this clean, build conf minus F, CN. I should probably ch change this to a VCS clean, but this clean should do it initially. Um, CN is a little configure script that I have baked in with all the right configure switches, make, sudo make install. So this will upgrade your PHP 7 install that's on the image to the current code on GitHub. Same thing if you want to rebuild the PHP 5.6 that I have built for this machine. You can go in, do the same thing, and then run CN 5.6. These older versions, 5.6, 5.5, 5.4, they don't change nearly as much. So you probably don't need to rebuild those, but you probably should build, rebuild PHP 7. So, how much time do I have? Oh, okay. The virtual machine is there. Please use it or simply grab the code yourself. If you're very comfortable with installing and compiling PHP, installing all the dependencies and stuff that you need, if you're not that comfortable, grab my virtual machine because everything is just ready to go. It's in the build environment. That's, everything is set up for you. You don't have to think. You just install it. Then go into var dub dub dub. I have it here. Let's see. Vagrant SSH. So it looks like this. You have a PHP source directory. Um, I have a PHP memcached D directory just because I was working in my version of the virtual machine, porting PHP memcached D to PHP 7. So there's a PHP source directory, and here's where you can then go in and do git branch, see which branch we're on. Master, a few branches checked out. And applications you would install in var dub dub dub. You can put things in here. Put the WordPress directory in here, put the Drupal directory in here, and, and hit it. I wouldn't use this for benchmarking. I would more use it for making sure that your applications work. Benchmarking using virtual machines tends to always be a bad idea because you're mostly benchmarking the virtual machine, not necessarily a real production environment. All right, and is the wireless working now? Nobody knows? No? Is it? I tried to connect earlier. It wasn't. I wanted to show you that one thing. But while I do that, questions? Have you thought of any in the last 30 minutes? Up there? Yes. Right. That implementation of it, yeah. I don't like the dual mode part of it, and I also think it's too restrictive.
restricted in, in its usefulness in the sense that you're going to end up casting a whole lot of things. It's not like you can suddenly switch your entire library over to use scalar types because, for example, if you have an object with a two-string method, it's not going to work, right? If you, if you have a function that takes a string and you pass it to that, that object, even though it has a two-string, it's going to say, this is not a string, this is an object, right? So you're going to have to cast that to a string. Now, if that object was null or something else, the whole point of scalar typing is out the window there because a hard cast will force it, no matter what it is, what that object is, it'll force it to a string. And you're not going to get a notice or an error or anything. And, but you, you, sure there is. Of course there is. Well, I don't want to argue that right now. But of, of course there is. Um, as soon as you try to use it, you will get an error. A hard cast will change it over to a string, right? And you won't notice that that happened. And so I don't like that part. I don't like the part that it, it's so strict that it can really only be used for sort of inner functions. You can't use it as in a big library, but you can use it maybe in the authentication function, um, any sort of crypto stuff where you really, really do know the types of everything. And you can ensure the types without having to cast. But if, I mean, if you have a two-string object, right, you're going to have to cast that to a string. You're going to have to force cast it to a string if you want to pass it into anything that takes a string. There's no other way of doing it. And I don't like that the design calls for force casting. So that's my main issue. And the fact that it's dual mode. I'd rather clean up the mode. And I'd rather clean up so the PHP on the whole and have actual type hints that are hints that will warn you if you pass in the wrong type that lets you help clean up your code versus the, sort of this big hammer that I agree it's useful, but I just don't think enough code can fall under the umbrella of its usefulness. It's more for only for new code. It's not going to help clean up any existing code at all. It's not going to make Drupal better. It's not going to make WordPress better. It's probably not going to make your code any better. But it will, it will allow you to write new code that's cleaner. So that's my main objection to it. Yes? That's a little bit weird, but that's because how application works. And we know this, it actually consumes about twice as much memory. So that was surprising. So my question, do you think that's, that's possible, or we just doing something wrong? With it? So it's using, it's using twice as much memory? It's, it's, it's unlikely because most of the internal data structures, the, the way a lot of the performance was achieved was by reducing the size of the internal data structures. So. Most of the things we're passing along, passing around internally, <coughs> takes up less space in PHP 7. So if you have some code that is using twice as much memory in PHP 7 versus PHP 5, then I'd like to see your code. You may be tickling some weird part of it, but I can't think of a piece of PHP 7 code that would use twice the memory of PHP 5. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of processes. And it's probably the overhead of each individual process. But you're running the same number of processes on the PHP 5 version. That's correct, yes. So I, I, don't, I don't see how that's possible. But if you're seeing it, then and it probably is. It'd be interesting to know what's special about your particular code that's triggering that. Maybe, I mean, I, maybe you had built a debug versus non debug? Um, no, I shouldn't do the case. OK. Well, the double check that one is not enabled debug and one is disabled debug because that does add memory overhead. Make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Yeah. Um, if you have a hip hop VM based on HP5, um, five optimizations, do you anticipate that if they move to seven, they're going to get that much better again? No. <laughs> no. So, so the question was if hip hop, if HHRAM moves to PHP7, will they get? twice the performance? No, because it's all about how the engine is written internally. PHP 5 versus PHP 7, when you're talking about HHVM, 
that it's syntax, it's, it's features, it's not performance. They, their engine is very, very different. It's JIT based. Um, and there's no JIT in PHP yet. Now, PHP now has HHVM like performance without a JIT, which is quite interesting because then if you add JIT on top of PHP, then you might be able to expect another jump on the PHP side. For, for HHVM to get another big jump, they have to do something similar to what we did in PHP and actually make the non-JIT code faster. And that's not something they can copy across because when they say it's based on PHP 5, it's the syntax and the language features that they're basing it on. It's not the engine code that they're basing it on. Yes? You've made a whole heap of performance improvements so far. Yeah. Is there any more scope for performance improvements in the next three or four months? In the next three or four months? Minor ones. Maybe a couple of percent here and there. Um, if, you're, if you watch the commits, you will see mostly Dimitri is occasionally fixing something. I saw a commit this morning where he, he went in and he optimized one specific feature. So it's not sort of across the board performance enhancements at this point. It is now individual pieces. And if your code happens to use that particular feature a lot, yeah, you might expect a huge jump, but you may not do it at all. So an example of that, Chen Chen, two months ago, improved the sort algorithm. So the sorting algorithm was faster. If you're not sorting big arrays of elements, that improvement isn't going to help you at all. But if you are sorting hundreds of thousands of elements in arrays, you're going to see a huge jump because it's quite a bit faster. Going past the initial release, is there any plans for more improvements? Um, yeah, I mean, those type of things that don't affect, well, sort of is a bad example because that actually did affect functionality slightly in the sense that if two elements compare the same, the order is undefined. And the order, while it has always been undefined in PHP, has always remained constant. In PHP 7, the order is now no longer the same as PHP 5 for equivalent elements. So that was a bad example. And that one we probably wouldn't do in a point release, but other optimizations minor optimization that go in and target specific things, as long as they don't change functionality from the user's perspective, then yeah, we, we always do those. Um, but in the past 18 months, there's been a lot more focus on looking for things like that that we can improve. Um, I, I, I think I saw a comment this morning from Dimitri where he was optimizing JSON decode, right? Where like decoding a big JSON object is now going to be a little bit faster today than it was yesterday. But we're talking minuscule things here. Others? Yes? Um, did you figure out what made hip hop start in WordPress versus PHP 7? <coughs> so because hip hop is a is a JIT, they tune it for almost for styles of code. <coughs> And they have gone in, they, they used WordPress as, as their benchmark app, just like we did. Um, they used WordPress as a benchmark app. So HHVM is very tuned towards WordPress style, essentially. And they also worked with Wikipedia to make HHVM fast for media. So I, I mean, it's really hard. I did look. I, learned, I was looking through the code trying to figure out what exactly made this huge jump. For, for WordPress, but basically, with a JIT, you can tune it for specific types of code. And they have specifically tuned it for both WordPress and for MediaWiki. And you see that in the numbers that move. And for code, for code that they haven't specifically looked at, the performance is still impressive, but it's not as impressive as for things they have specifically tuned HHVM for. Now, it'd be interesting to see what happens in with a PHP JIT eventually. If we can go in and we can, especially if we can provide some kind of user visible tuning there where you can go in and tune your own JIT. So that's, that's sort of what interests me in the next two or three years is what happens when we try adding a JIT on top of PHP? What kind of tunability? Because HHVM has shown us that this is possible. Five years ago, I probably think, ah, that is just, 
that's just too hard of a problem. Um, they threw so much money at it, so many people at it, and showed them out, it's possible. And once you see that it's possible, then the problem suddenly becomes sort of in scope. It's like, okay, well, I know that there is a possible result at the end. Beforehand, it's sort of like driving off into the distance, hoping there'll be something there. Chances are there isn't, and it's a long drive. Right? It's, it's a lot of work getting to the point where you might get there and say, well, it's just, it doesn't work. But the biggest thing I think HHVM has done to PHP is shown us that this is actually possible. So I expect to see some interesting work on JITs in the PHP world over the next two or three years. <coughs> yes? What tools do you use for benchmarking and collecting that data? Um, it was on my little slide here. I was using Siege for my thing. Uh, where is it? Here. Same script 12 times. Boom, 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 boom. So you have to have some warm up code that says, okay, I'm going to bang the most frequently used paths on my, my application. I'm going to bang them 12 times, each of them 12 times. And then my server is up to speed. Now I can let users hit it at this point. But as Pierre said, for code paths like static configuration things that don't change over those 12 requests, that's what the JIT does. It looks at it and goes, well, this was the same every time. It's always going to be the same. We're going to optimize and just assume next time it's going to be the same thing. If one of these configuration changes, then suddenly it will still find it, but then that application will go perform it will go like this if you do change the configuration, which is something you almost never change. So that's where the JIT gets its speed from. It just looks at things and says, okay, this branch is always true. Well, this branch is always false. We'll just assume next time it's going to be true here, it's false here, true here, false here, and fast track through those things. So, and I'm not sure WordPress is that much more guilty than other things of doing that, but it does contribute to it. All right, last question. Um, will PHP service language improvements come to HHV? Um, so, the interesting thing is we have a, a spec now which is not quite up to PHP 7. It's getting there. As we're adding new features to PHP 7, people are adding it to the spec. And in theory, anything that wants to run PHP code should adhere to the spec, the language spec. You can go to php.net slash spec and read through it. So yes, that was the whole point of the spec, is in theory, HHVM will adhere to the spec. <laughs> um, so, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. They, they will eventually. They're not there yet. We're not there yet either. We don't have PHP 7 released. 
But I expect a year from now, maybe 18 months from now, HHVM will have all the features of PhD studies. And by the way, you can contribute to the specification. So I will take Whiter and so on. It's on GitHub or if you don't have my own data, you can continue to improve them and complete them and so on. So, I'm going to show you this one thing I had to fix. I think I actually have it. Here. Oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, there. Okay. Yes. This was the one fix I had to make. And it wasn't actually to work. Or do I go for track? <coughs> so they had this. This belongs to a column where they're in PHP 5. This gets the reference first, so that belongs to column. So you pull, you have this belongs to array, and you pull out the column, and then this becomes the name of the property in the object. Now in PHP 7, this is read left to right. So it's going to try to do this, then have a property name belongs to, and it's going to try to dereference the column as opposed to a local variable, right? So if you really want to do this part first, you have to tell it. So this was the patch that I submitted upstream to this database model to fix. So th this was the Avalon database library, which is a, um, a composer component that is actually present in other things too that I noticed. So that was the one change. I'm out of time. I can see folks getting antsy. Thank you very much. <laughs>